and welcome back to Public Sector Voices with Emily Rogers. Today we're joined by Mayor of Bristol City Council, Marvin Rees. He was elected in 2016 and is the founder and programme lead at the Bristol Leadership Programme. He's worked to reduce health and wealth inequality in Bristol, as well as working with NHS Bristol's public health team on delivering race equality in mental health. Great to have you on with us today. Um, so as someone who writes about local government for a living, I have to say that I, I do love Bristol. It always seems as though the council is ahead of the curve with new ideas. And recently, Bristol's been in the news for being at the forefront of fighting for race equality. Can you give us a little bit of a, a brief indication of what the last few weeks have been like for you? Well, for, for me personally, it's been incredibly busy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I came in, I did an interview on Channel 4, um, came in the next day and then just all morning the requests for interviews were piling in so I just sat at my desk and did interview after interview dropped off for an hour in between to do a session with World Economic Forum and this is back to interviews yeah. so it's just been so much um, attention um, so, but for the city it's also been a really challenging time we've got um, you know people who were absolutely elated that the statue's been pulled down there are people who sympathise with it coming down but, but didn't don't like the way it happened, um, and then there were people who were really angry about the statue coming down, you know, and, and obviously shades within each of those groups as well. And um, so the city's grappling with that, and uh, we also need to make sure that Bristol is a city in which there is a home for all of those people, because we need to be able to live with our difference, um, and people need to be respected, even if they're not getting exactly uh, what they want at any one time. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a big time of self-reflection for Bristol at the moment. Yeah, and have you felt like a change in, in atmosphere or, or anything like that in attitude since it's happened? Well, when you when you have a big symbolic, uh, you know, a kind of a momentous event like that, clearly it impacts on people's sense of the city. Yeah. Um, so there's certainly a heightened awareness, just like there is across the rest of the country and many parts of the world, um, yeah. of issues of race and race inequality. Um and that is a positive conversation. But it also brings another conversation where people feel that because someone's talking about race, they're not talking about their issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've had a, um, you know, a little bulge in hate mail coming in, you know, gollywogs sent to me, letters telling me to go back to my own country and all that type of stuff. And that has really kind of picked up. Uh, not just not, I know that's not just the Bristol people, that's, that's actually stuff from outside Bristol yeah, wow. as well. So, um, so yeah, there's certainly um, I would describe it as an energised culture, um, yeah. you know, and some of that energy is positive and building, and some of that energy is negative and and is very angry and um, wants to to pull things down. And some of it's some of it's concerned and confused that may come across like anger, but it's people looking for their place. So of the three kind of categories that you mentioned earlier in terms of the reaction to the the statue being removed, where would you say that you kind of fit in where was your what was your gut reaction when you found out it happened well i've wanted the statue to be gone for a long time yeah um and um i've always um felt you know that it was a personal affront that we've got you know iconic things in the city that honor and they are an honor they don't tell history having the colston hall is not a history lesson having a statue is not a history lesson Mm -hmm. it's about honoring people that we honour honouring someone who was a slaver and who may well have owned one of my ancestors, mm. um, you know, and eight, over eighty thousand, you know, kidnapped Africans were part of his business venture, and I don't think that's okay. Um, so I I shared that when, um, you know, when I heard the statue had been pulled down, um, you know, it wasn't something I was sad about in and yeah. of itself. At the same time, as a as a politician, I'm also very concerned about uh, public order, yeah. and I cannot condone criminal damage. So I've got two uncomfortable bedfellows there. <laughs> but um, my overwhelming position is, I will not mourn the move, removal of that statue. Yeah. And I, you know, and I Fair welcome, enough. and I welcome the energised conversation in the city. Yeah, and the statue is going to be moved into a museum now, obviously people claiming that removing it is removing part of British history and things like that. But, I mean, I have to be totally honest and say that I had no idea about Colston and the extent of Britain's role, really, in the slave trade. How far do you think that this is an education problem in the UK? It's a massive education problem. It's just, it's, it's just bad history. Colston, um, 
you know, it, it, it's politicised history, isn't it? Mm. It's it's branding history. To to have a, a statue up that tells you that he was a wise and virtuous son in the city, which is what the plaque on the statue said. That's just you know half a truth is no truth in that sense. So um, it's a problem. St- statues don't teach us history. Statues statues tell us who we should consider to be our heroes, mm. um, and that's not always based on truth. Um, I think what will happen. So I I, th- I find that debate that discussion. I can understand why people are having it. Um, but what I can't understand is why high-profile leaders, including in the Gold government, um, peddle it that yeah. somehow tackling our, you know, our memorials are are undermining our history. Um, you know, in this, in Bristol, we're we're actually commissioning a history group um, of um, academics and um, community historians as well to begin telling the full story of Bristol. That's not taking anything away. It's yeah. It's bringing a fullness to our understanding of the city's journey. And we're, we're at pains to point it out. No one's taken anything away from anyone. Mm. Uh, what we wanted you to have is a full understanding of our journey and how we, we, we came to become who we are. If anything is being taken away, um, you know, it's the, you know, misplaced worship of one-dimensional uh, portrayals of, you know, of people in British history. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure any of us would like to be... Uh, you know, would like to be uh, have, have our our misunderstandings uh, put right. That, that's a that's a journey towards maturity. To me, this is not about guilt. It's not about emotion. It's just doing good quality history. You know, of, of our country, taken away from uh, the, you know the political games that have surrounded it historically. So, would you support the kind of claims that the the curriculum needs to change and people need a better kind of more truthful, broader view of British history? I'd always be for a more truthful curriculum, you know, and a fuller curriculum that equips us to cope with the world the way it is. Uh, you know, and the world is, we live in cities that are global, that are international. We want to be trading internationally. We have a culture that's global. You can't understand. We can't understand what goes on in any particular place unless we understand what goes on around the world. You can't understand, you know, the the, the economic hardships, uh, you know, of the, of the 1930s without understanding the great crash in the United States. Mm. You can't understand, you know, Britain in the 60s unless you understand the Cold War. <laughs> you know, you can't. So we have to, um, we have to understand uh, what's going on around the world and how our country's history is interdependent with that. Black history, in that sense, that, to the extent that we begin to tell the story of black history is not a bolt on. It's just part of it. But we should be doing the same on working class history too, the history of unions. We should be doing the same on the history of women and gay people uh, within the country. These are all critical stories um, that, 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 are, that are, you know, key threads within that overall British journey. If we miss them out, we, we end up actually just telling the story of rich people. Yeah. And uh, that's not good enough, right? <laughs> yeah, and do you, do you think if those histories were more deeply embedded into the national curriculum, which, let's be honest, they're not, do you think that would obviously, honestly make a, a more positive difference like to the children of the future generations? Well, I, I mean, I think so, because it, because it, it, gives, you, it gives you better material to, mm. to, make, to, to tackle questions of identity and belonging. One of, one of the big questions at the moment, I think the political questions, is who belongs, right? It's all around the migration crisis. Yeah. Who, who are you and who belongs and who doesn't belong? It's, that was a big question in the, the Brexit conversation. Um, you know, and I, and I think one of the... One, so, for example, on the, the conversation on migration now, I think one of the big challenges on migration is people saying, well, we don't know who we are anymore. What's our history? Mm-hmm. You know, people don't know the British story. What's the big narrative they're a part of in, in, you know, in Britain? And, and one of the reasons that that story is, is so weak and so fragile is because there's a because it's been a half-told story. Yeah. You know, um, if, if we equip people with, with, with better tools to know about that, that journey, then they're, they're better equipped to cope with change. Like I'm a mixed, you know, I, I've been sharing a lot, I'm a mixed-race man. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I have grown up with that sense of um, Jamaican-ness, Englishness, Welshness, and then I found out about some Irishness. You know, having all those aspects to my character does not make me uh, weak or blow about. In fact, the ability to grapple with that dynamism and that difference and the challenge and the, you know, the, the black-white identity in the middle of racial conflict to the 80s, it's just made me more, more, more aware of who I am, not as a stagnant piece of unmoving concrete, mm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But as the fact that identity is fluid, it moves. That doesn't mean you lack coherence. It just means you know that there's there's many dimensions to who we are. You man, woman, old, young, gay, straight, black, white. (laughs) That portrayal of our identity has not has not equipped people to cope with dynamic, you know, identities. And in a globalized world, that's a problem. And and it sounds like you don't struggle with that same kind of where do I belong notion. So what would you say to the people who do struggle with that? I have to understand that they struggle with it, you know, and understand why and not judge them. Uh, this is, again, I, I saw even the, the, the people that were involved in the, the cenotaph protest the week after. Yeah. Right? You know, I didn't want to just judge and demonize. People started saying, oh, they're far right. They weren't all far right. They were far right there, but not everyone was far right. And in fact, there were black people down there too, mixed race people, you know, but um, you have to understand that otherwise you just push them aside and you alienate them. And in fact, I had a conversation with someone who was involved in that. We went and had a chat on the, you know, just last weekend. Mm -hmm. And it was a really constructive conversation. And he was saying, look, we don't, I don't oppose Black Lives Matter. I think the Colston statue was was right to go but they're really concerned about their place in bristol and they've got a lot of young people a lot of young white working class people who feel like they're losing their city yeah my, my point to them was they're right to feel like they're losing their city they are losing their city but they're not losing it to uh you know racial and ethnic diversity or different religions they're losing it to house prices mm. so the city in which they used to be able to afford to live in is now no longer affordable <laughs> so they are losing their purchase and what we need to do is understand why they say they feel the way they do, why they take positions they do, and then into the discussion with them about whether their conclusions they draw from that are accurate or, near, or inaccurate, and then talk about how we're trying to solve those challenges. Yeah, I think that's really kind of a constructive way to look at it. So having the only black mayor in the UK, do you feel like the people of, of Bristol are better placed to lead the way for this movement? I don't know about that. Um, See, the dilemma of being a black politician uh, is that people expect more from you on race, mm-hmm. but you have a, a narrower scope to do things on race, right? So it's, I'm not claiming to be Obama by any stretch of the imagination, but you saw it around <laughs> Obama. You know, you could never have got away with some of the stuff that Trump has said. Yeah. You know, I describe it like this. What's the, what's the Colin Kaepernick price you pay, right? Why is Colin Kaepernick not playing American football anymore? Yeah. He's not injured. He didn't lose his talent. He spoke out on race. Look what happened to Raheem Sterling. Same that impacts on politicians like myself. I'd suggest maybe Sadiq Khan as well. Though obviously Sadiq uh, needs to talk for, talk for himself on that front. Yeah. Um, but there's this there's this rabbit hole I get dragged into where if I talk about race, they say, "Oh look, black politicians, it's bad to talk about race." It's like some really naive question I had from the ITV local reporter, actually, and the local BBC journalist, um, two white journalists saying, "Well, why didn't you do something on? Why didn't you take the statue down?" I said, "What well, you know, that is a that is a question that is that is not that is not worthy of anyone who claims to have any political insight. If I'd come in as the first black politician and I made taking down Colston's statue a very controversial debate in the city, my top priority, that's all I would have been known for. Yeah. Nothing about affordable housing, nothing about transport, climate change, pedestrianisation, children's mental health. I'm just a black politician who wants to get rid of Colston from Bristol, and then I'm the one that's erasing white." that perception of white history uh, from the city is absolute madness. So what, yeah, clearly, clearly there is a role for me uh, because of who I am, but it's, it's a role I take uh, very, very carefully. And I think the city takes very, very carefully because it, it doesn't come without great cost and, and great danger. Yeah. And the danger is as well that you kind of would be forgotten for all of the other amazing things that are happening in Bristol. I know you were the first um, council to declare a climate emergency and it's things like that that need to happen. So you don't kind of, I suppose, want to overshadow that with other things. No. And, you know, some of the symbolic act, you know, I mean, when I was first elected, um, you know, kind of trolls in the city, but also I, I, I actually I would I was very sad to see even some of my opposition politicians indulged in this idea that I'm an inner city mayor, right? Right. That was the term that was used. I mean, that's code, right? You know what it means. Yeah. (laughs) It means black mayor. Um, And it was a, it was a, an un, it was a subtle but, but unsubtle attempt to, you know, detach me from um, elements of the electorate in Bristol. And it was one I found absolutely disgusting. So, you know, I have to walk through that minefield of, of sensitivity, misunderstanding, failed understanding, you know, as well as how we build relationships across across boundaries. And that comes with me being a mixed race man with a white family that goes back in Bristol for centuries, probably longer than 
some of the people that were indulging in that. Um, so it is. It's a. Uh, it's a very. Um, it's, it's a place you have to walk very carefully. Yeah, because this is something that I really wanted to talk to you about. Obviously, people who listen to our podcast and read our magazines are, you know, largely public sector professionals. And I have had a look into it and, and done a bit of research and on into leadership roles in local government. And they are overwhelmingly white Christian males. And I just want to try and understand, you know, why you think that is and what, what can be done to kind of make it a more inclusive place and so that people like you take up these roles don't get that kind of reaction. Well, that's a, that them again. I mean, you got a huge question there. I mean, it's going to be tied up with our wider, the wider drivers of social immobility. On you, yeah. by definition, leadership is power. It's the British elite. You think about the um, elitist Britain reports that came out um, around about 2014. I think there was a follow-up. Um, Alan um, Milburn's old, you know, social mobility commission. You know, all those drivers of just people being in the right place at the right time. But people aren't in the right place at the right time with the right networks by accident, right? Mm. They're, they're born into them, and some of it's conscious, and some of it's just because they've been placed there. So, and then there's that tendency within that for leadership to recreate itself in its own image. Yeah. Um, you know, people saying, well, you know, oh, yeah, I trust that guy, I trust that person's judgment. They get it. What they mean is they think like me. <laughs> they said what I would have said. Definitely. I heard that when I was in the BBC about people making editorial decisions, and, you know, it was like, yeah, they get it. <laughs> they think like me, so let's promote them. And you end up, you know, you end up recreating uh, yourself. You end up looking for yourself. And we're all vulnerable to that, right? That's not that's not unique to kind of uh, institutional racism. That's what we do. And um, I suppose the the art of a good leader is to get to the point where you can understand the need to have a diversity of thought around you, and where you have the confidence to bring thoughts around you that will actually cash with your own. And you don't see that as a negative. You see it as a place to have that creative tension. Um, I, I you know, I'm fallen like everyone else. I'm not saying I've mastered it, but surely it is. It's the art form of, you know, of, of top quality leadership, isn't it? Definitely. And this idea of diversity of thought is it's becoming really popular with a lot of companies around the world who are hiring, you know, diversity and inclusion managers purely for that for that only reason. But you don't see it obviously within local government. No, it's really interesting now, isn't it? Because we would. I suppose, you know, being stereotypical, you would see uh, l the public sector as being on the forefront of these social justice, you know, yeah. kind of what is seen as a social justice uh, move, right, to well, be fair. Help. But actually what, what you find is that the private sector are getting it. So there was a McKinsey report. It's called Diversity Matters. Mm -hmm. um, and they were saying that um, their studies show that um, if you have women in leadership, as in terms of diversity of thought, men and women, you're more likely to outperform the market. I think it's like, it's like I, don't, I forget how they measure it, but something like 18% potentially more likely to outperform the market. Oh. This is an American. But I think once you bring minorities in there as well, it goes up to about 28 to 30%. So the conclusion of their report is, so either you start accessing diversity of thought or you're going to get left behind. You know, And it stands to reason that you, you design your products, you design your services with a knowledge of the market you're trying to sell them to. So access that diversity of thought. If you just end up with a, excuse my categorization here, but a group of, you know, 55-year-old white middle-class men designing products and you're trying to sell it to 18-year-old working-class kids on an estate or, you know, 25-year-old black kids in the inner city, you're probably not going to do that well. No. <laughs> so but we need that kind of understanding with this, our right? public services, surely. Exactly. That's exactly the point. If we're accessing the diversity of thought with our public services, then we'll design the services right first time. Yeah. Rather than designing services, getting really poor social outcomes, that cost ending up turning up in other services that come in because our first initial look across the services didn't work or didn't meet the need, and then spending X pound a day on consultants to come in and try and fix it for us. Inequalities in mental health services are a classic example of that. Yeah. You know, I used to work in delivering race equality mental health, and one of the criticisms of mental health services is that they are designed for middle class white people, and yet we know it's uh, poor people and black and brown people who are coming up the wrong end of all of our uh, mental health services, not getting early interventions, uh, disproportionately sectioned, disproportionately uh, restrained because the services are not designed for them. And actually that ends up costing us, it costs them uh, social injustice, but it costs us lots of money. It's almost illogical because the kind of people who are designing and delivering these services aren't the kind of people who are receiving them. That's a challenge. So we, w w within those services, what we need to begin doing is obviously 
building in an intentional approach to diversifying the workforce. Mm. There's a there's a there's a great paper I've I've shared a lot um, about IBM. It's called Diversity as Strategy. It's Harvard Business Review paper. It's old now. I think it's about 2004. Um, but what they say is one of the reasons that IBM was able to turn around. I think it was Lou Gersh there was the head at the time was uh, people made a lot about its technological breakthroughs. But actually, one of the things that IBM did was make diversity uh, one of their top priorities, reported at every board meeting. Um, and it was about women, disabled people, and minorities, right? Mm-hmm. So they were who, so off the basis of this, they were able to hoover up women-owned businesses, right? Because they yeah. understood the market. They able to they were able to capitalize on a major change in federal law around disabled people because they knew it was coming because of the people in their organization, and they were making major headroads into minority-owned um, businesses in the United States. It made them tens of millions of dollars just because they had the intelligence in their organization, um, and that's that's I think that's what the private sector has understood. It's what the public sector has talked about, but not necessarily understood the business case no. or been ill-equipped to deliver against that business case. Yeah, and, and continuing on with public services, people tend to kind of brush off the issue of racism within the police as like an American issue. Do you think that the UK is innocent on, on this matter? No, not by a long stretch, the imagination. I mean, we, we, I actually, I've defended the police in Bristol here because I think the way they managed the Black Lives Matter event in Bristol was outstanding, mm-hmm. despite what the Home Secretary said. And um, you know, we have a fantastic uh, chief constable. I think we have a really good uh, police crime commissioner and a really good city commander. So in terms of the leadership in even the Somerset Police, I've been very, uh, very positive about that. But I will share that even as mayor, I had an incident where I was, <laughs> I had to drive home um, in the middle of the morning. And um, I ended up in a situation where a police officer was being incredibly rude to me. Um, but he hadn't recognized me. Really? It was a real, if you've seen the film in the heat of the night recently, Poitier, it was like that. He had not recognized me. And I said to him, do you talk to all members of the public like that? And he just carried on. And then it twigged. And then he tried to start trying to backtrack and being polite. But he, he's already too late. He'd gone too far. And then I, But I'm in a position where I can report that. So no, and I, you know, and, you know I've, been, I've, I've seen it. We've got some good police officers, but obviously there are some some bad practices out there. The police, just like any other institution, is a reflection of society, yeah. and it's a fallen society that is um, that is you know infiltrated by by racism. It, it does amaze me when people say that the you know the UK isn't racist. Like the Conservatives tweeted out a Happy Father's Day picture with a um, a black son and father, and the comments were just the, all the proof that you need that the country has a big problem. That's an insult. That's like that's like trying to counter George Floyd by sending out pictures of white police officers dancing with black people. Yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you think we are? You know, what I mean, that's 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 a you know, that that kind of gesture politics shows an absolute lack of understanding of the issue, um, and it shows a lack of respect for uh, for the significance of of the challenge of of racism at hand and for the reality and for its power. Um, that I I haven't seen that tweet, but. Um, but it goes that, back to what we were saying. They're not good. going to get it if their if their kind of board is not made up of people who represent society. Yeah, that's that's one of the things. But you know, you you need to begin pulling people in um, who 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 are reflective of society, but also they need to come in positions of power. Mm. I've been in situations where I've been coming as the only black person, right? And that makes it really well, even like this politically now. Then basically. Sometimes that 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 leaves people thinking they don't need to raise it because the black guy will raise it, right? All right? And then you carry the burden of having to talk about race again. And then when you talk about race, are oh, they talking about race again? It's all they ever talk about, <laughs> it, you know. So you, people need to come onto these boards with positions of power, and it's everyone's responsibility yeah. um, to be able to talk about these issues. And I would say, actually, if you are a leader of an organisation and you do not have an understanding. And I don't mean an emotional understanding. If you don't have an intellectual understanding of race uh, and racism, just like if you don't have an understanding of sexism and why there's a gender pay gap, then you're probably not equipped to really lead the organization. Yeah. You know, Or you have a major oversight that you need to get some work on. You need to get some books and do a little bit of study um, because understanding the context in which you are working is an integral part of what it means to be an effective leader. Yeah, and I think a lot of people aren't are recognising that, especially in recent weeks. I know that a couple of weeks, well, a couple of days after the protests, 
the all the books about race were sold out in Waterstones and on Amazon and that kind of thing is a step in the right direction but obviously it needed to happen a long time ago yeah yeah and um like I said I, I approach this like this right this is not about guilt I'm not going to go home and give my white mum my time for being white mm. right I'll talk about race and racism all its fullness but it's not about guilt it's not about you know any kind of emotions and feelings people may want to go there this is just about developing a rigorous understanding of the way society works yeah its strengths, its weaknesses, its dysfunctionality, its opportunities. It, it, it's, it's proper leadership that uh, really helps, and that has to be based on knowledge. So I guess the, the golden question is what, what's next? How do we make sure that these issues don't just become another hashtag and, and really kind of see a change? That's the massive question. <laughs> I, I mean, some, some, some of the, you know, we're doing a piece of work in the city on the city's history, as I mentioned um, earlier on, but mm -hmm. some some of these issues don't look like overt racial um, race interventions. It's building affordable homes. Yeah. You know, it's it's tackling um, educational um, uh, inequalities, making making sure our schools are are properly um, equipped. It's funding local government, you know, so that we can um, adequately, so we can run decent quality youth services. Um, in, you know, in a city, um, dealing with race is about is about supporting. Uh, black and brown people to be able to move through um, hierarchies in that sense. It's also about tackling social immobility. But that's where you begin to say, actually, the interventions we're making don't just benefit black and brown people; they benefit white people too. Mm -hmm. So when you begin to when you begin to address social immobility, working class white people benefit. When when you when you support people to have affordable homes, they're probably in a stronger position to be able to cope with social change. They're not going to feel that they you know. The migrants coming into the community or the people that don't look like me are threatening my job and threatening my house and they're in a stronger position to be uh, welcoming i mean there's a lot of complexity around that um but but fundamentally i think tackling racism is not about sitting around a campfire singing kumbaya and being nice to each other and eating world food or even listening to bob marley you know it is about economic change yeah and when people begin to relate as economic and political equals then you can build relationships of genuine trust and people are more confident um, interacting with um, uh, with people who, on the face of it, may not seem like them. Definitely. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to work towards, I suppose. Well, thank you. I could stay talking to you all day, but thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. And, um, yeah, I hope next time that we meet up, I know you're part of our editorial board now, next time that we chat, hopefully we'll have um, kind of noticed a difference or seen something change. Yeah, I hope so. All right. <laughs> Brilliant. Take thank care. You very Thanks much. very much. Bye. Coming up on next week's show, we'll be speaking to Sarah Rouse, leader of Malvern Hills District Council.